Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale radio-controlled ArmorTech British Firefly Sherman tank. Since the last video update, a lot of progress has been made on the model's rear firewall detailing as well as the actual radio control equipment interior layout. We'll be going over these additions and modifications in this video. And here goes the components for the tank smoke system. For the smoke system on this model, I'll be utilizing the smoke system which was supplied with the Armor Tech kit. The Armor Tech smoke system is a very nicely engineered unit and assembles very easily and performs very well. The unit that you see here has been partially assembled by myself. What you see here are three separate components. The main tub, the bottom mounting plate, as well as the top cover. The tub and the top cover are made out of CNC aluminum, while the bottom plate is made out of a, pa a piece of laser cut steel. Everything is pre-drilled, tapped, and threaded, and assembles very easily like I mentioned before. At one thing I did before the assembly of all the parts was I went ahead and added a coat of gray primer to the components in the way you see here. Also included with the set is a hollow brass CNC threaded tube, a CNC nylon mounting bushing, a CNC nylon mounting block, several plumbing fittings made out of copper, as well as several CNC brass fittings, two PVC tubes, some fasteners, a nylon tube, as well as the electronical components, which are in this bag. The electronic components would include the blower fan, a main power kill switch, a small little transformer, as well as the most important component and that is of the heating element. As you see, it's all come pre-wired and can be assembled out of box. Also included is a little fiber mat. The mat here is your actual wick, which once installed into the little tub here, into the reservoir, and when impregnated with the smoke fluid agent, is what actually smokes as it, the element gets hot. It starts cooking the mat, which doesn't burn, but the gets hot enough for the smoke's fluid to start evaporating, which gives you your smoke. And here goes the smoke system just prior to final installation. Starting with the tub, one thing that has been installed is that of the mat. The mat itself was rolled into a nice little roll and slipped over the brass tube, which was showcased earlier. I have also pre-soaked the mat with the smoke fluid. Now you don't want to have too much smoke fluid inside as you don't want to have the component as a bathtub with the smoke fluid. Just a nice little damping should be enough to get the component to where you want it. With the piece now pre-soaked, it's time to do the installation. Prior to the installation though, on the top portion here, as you can see, I went ahead and mounted on the fan mounting block as well as the small fittings. Currently, the fan is not installed and will be installed shortly after the filming of this scene. As for the fittings, this is one portion of the ArmorTech smoke system which makes it very unique and very recommended for use in RC tanks. Due to the way there are all these mounting holes on the top portion of the system. This makes the component highly customizable in mounting the piece in your tank. Say if you want to mount the, the smoke system directly butt up against to the firewall, you would have this portion here plugged up with the one fitting, and this fitting here would be moved to the top portion, to which then you would have direct access to the smoke system, or to your exhaust detail manifolds. The smoke fluid refueler can then be moved to one of the other locations. For the purposes on this vehicle here, I will go ahead and go for a side mounting procedure or a setup. I will mount in the 
elbow to which the rest of the plumbing will shortly be affixed. Now to mount the upper and lower halves together, I will first go ahead and add a small little bead of silicone around the rim of the tub. The purpose of the silicone is that it gives you a nice airtight seal on this box here. The importance of that is that it will prevent any smoke from seeping out through the sides rather than being funneled out through the exhaust. With this sealed system, it also optimizes the use of the fan, which will then in turn blow any of the smoke to the path of least resistance, which in this case will be the exhaust manifold outlet. Now the component is ready for its fasteners. There are four Allen fasteners which bolt the component together. Now, unlike all of the other times you see me bolting things together on these models, this is the one time where red Loctite will not be used. The reason why you do not want to use Loctite for this is in case you do have to get access to the mat and perform any type of maintenance, you don't want to have the pieces permanized on there with the Loctite. However, to prevent any of the pieces from backing out, I will simply just use some of the silicone in, on the threads, which will be more than suffice for a nice temporary bond, which will keep everything in place. And here's the component now, fully assembled, and, and now waiting its electronical components to be added. As you see, I went ahead and thoroughly blended over all of the seams with the silicone, as well as also all the openings to which were plugged with the small fittings, as well as the block itself. This again is to ensure thorough air tightness of the unit, which will result in more efficient smoke to be emitted from the setup. And here are the exhaust funnels just prior to final assembly and paint. The funnels that you see here are again the same design which was used on the M4A4. The design utilizes the, fi the following components. For the funnel tips, these here are my Resin EastCoastArmory.com Sherman exhaust manifold set. The ECA version is designed for static use and is solid with a molded in stem detailing. To adapt it for this radio control vehicle, I went ahead and amputated the molded in tube section. I hollowed out the funnels via the mill so that the smoke could flow through. As for the tube, on this version here, I went ahead and used a brass tube that has been crimped and soldered, so it's nice and airtight. And this here will actually protrude from the rear of the firewall in order for the smoke to funnel out. To adapt the to adapt the funnel to mount onto the ArmorTech Supply PVC ring, I had to make a small little adapter. The adapter itself, just like on the other build, I went ahead and recycled an old bullet shell casing. For this vehicle here, I'm using a, a scrap 308 caliber shell. The 308, it's nice as that it has a nice taper to it, which wedges in nice and firmly into the PVC. This one here has already been cut off, and the same procedure will be done to this shell casing over here. And here goes the rear firewall grill work, all fabricated up and ready for prime paint and installation. Just like on the M4A4, the components are comprised out of two pieces. You have first the box frame, and you have the grill itself. The grill is nothing more than some varmint mesh, which is cut to the shape of the slot that is found on the firewall, on the tank itself. And the box frame is fabricated out of strips of brass, which is all soldered together. We have three straps over here, which will be used for fasteners to actually bolt the frame to the tank. Just like it is on the real vehicle. Like I said before, this exact same design was utilized on the M4A4 build, which I did a few years ago. Moving on from the exhaust manifold takes us to the smoke deflector grill. The smoke deflector grill that you see here is all scratch built. It was not supplied with the kit. And it's all scratch built out of 
brass strip and brass angle. It is all soldered together and no adhesives are used. The component bolts to the rear of the tank via these fasteners along the rim as well as two more fasteners on the bottom. Now this component here is not found on my version of the M4A4. The reason for that is that my M4A4 build depicts that of a more earlier variation of the M4A4 and this deflector grill that you see here was a later development and came a little bit sh more after the version that I built would have been in service. It's important to note that the M4A4 has two styles of deflector grill. You have this version here which is kept inside the bottom portion of the box which will be seen more clearly once installed and then there's another version which is hinged and that version was a retrofit that many of the M4A4s that went to Burma received. This component here will now be primed, painted, and then installed to the vehicle. Another portion of the rear firewall in order to complete it is that of the rear hatch detailing. Now the hatch detailing is going to be another area in which the Firefly will be different from your standard American M4A4. To start here I have the two hatch doors. These two doors were originally the kit supplied Armor Tech units. They were modified to make them into the appearance that you see here. The original kit supplied doors were boats comprised out of a single piece of CNC aluminum that has integral hinges as well as a small little block that is found on both sides. The doors originally were completely reversible. This detailing, like I mentioned in the A4 video, was a little bit basic and was also technically inaccurate for that of the Sherman door. The M4 A4 Sherman door is just like many of the other Sherman dual door designs in which you have a strip of metal that braces over both doors and bolts to the rear of the hull. Once that happens, the piece, once all the fasteners are on, prevents the other hatch from opening up. Typically there's also a small little handle that is found on this component. To modify the door to make it more to the British specs, I had to go ahead and modify the retention strip. On the British Shermans, the retention strip was cut off and at the halfway point mark over here. The hatch also gets mounted to the tank with only two fasteners as opposed to four. More than likely, this was done in order to save time in getting access to the engine as removing and reinserting all these fasteners can take a little bit of time. It's also important to note that this is a procedure typically found on British or Commonwealth vehicles. And if you see a vehicle with this modification done to it, chances are at some point in time it served with the British Army. As for the strip itself, it is fabricated out of a strip of brass that has been pinned and mounted to the aluminum plate. Currently the hatch is still not completed however as you can see the mounting holes have been added and on this hatch here I went ahead and with a tap I tapped the holes in which the mounting fasteners get bolted to. In addition to that detailing as you can see there's a small little lock mechanism that is found on each side. I believe this is for a padlock that holds the pieces in place in lieu of even using the fasteners. All that's needed to be added to these doors to complete them are some welds around the hinges as well as the smoke discharger boxes. The smoke discharger boxes are located on this door over here and the purpose of this system is that when you they're triggered by someone of by one of the crew members the smoke will bellow out of these two little boxes and help conceal the vehicle this is purely a british component and is not found on american tanks for the boxes themselves i will be utilizing the white metal set from armor packs the armor packs set is over here and comes unassembled. The pieces are very nicely done, like all or like most armor packs components, they are comprised out of casted white metal. And the pieces can be made functional with use of a Dremel and some small pins.
To mount the setup to the door, I had to fabricate a frame in which gets mounted to the door and then which the boxes get mounted to them. And here the smoke grenade box is now fully assembled. The all of the components that were supplied with the armor pack set were used. The only parts that are still need to be added are the components for the firing cables, which will be added once these components here are affixed to the doors. As you can see, the component was comprised out of three pieces. You had the main box, the hinge door, and the opening lever. Like I said before, the pieces are all made to be functional. Now, to assemble the components, you can go ahead and use super glue to keep everything together. However, like I mentioned in, in my other builds, is that when it comes to these armor packs components, I like to use solder to keep everything assembled. The solder is a stronger bond than super glue, and it bonds with the white metal as the white metal is solderable. Now, there is a caveat. The soldering should only be done by someone who has a lot of experience with fine point soldering. I say this because the metal that the pieces are casted in is almost identical to the melting temperature of the solder itself. If you are not careful, you can easily over melt the component, which will utterly destroy the piece and ruining it. So this is a type of procedure that should only be done with someone who has a lot of skill and experience with working with very fragile soldering. As for the part, like I said before, the part is functional. Now, one modification that I made to the armor, the armor pack set that is not included with the kit is that of the retention springs. The real unit has two springs located these, in these sections here, and the intent of the springs is to put constant pressure down on the latch, which secures it, this hinge component here via two little pegs. With the spring pressure being pulled inward, the pegs are secured by the latch and keeping everything in place. To open it, you would simply pull up on the piece and the piece would swing downward. As you just saw, the springs are fully functional and actually hold the piece in place. The springs were just my usual small micro springs and they have been added to the component in their appropriate locations. Like I said, they are fully functional and if I close it, you will hear the piece snap directly into its location. This is true for both units. The components are now going to be mounted to the mounting plate, which will then get affixed to the hatch door. And here is the hatch, fully completed and ready for painting. All of the detailing has been added, namely first that of the sculpted well detailing to the appropriate locations. And the smoke discharger boxes have also been mounted, along with their firing solenoids. As for mounting the boxes to the engine hatch, this is facilitated with that of a steel plate. This is one method that I have seen used frequently on British Shermans. There is a steel plate which is welded to the hatch itself, and then the two boxes then go ahead and bolt to each other via the steel plate. On the model, to make the piece nice and durable, the steel plate has two fasteners that are soldered to it. Those fasteners are then mounted to the inside portion here of the hatch with fasteners. Now, since this hatch will not necessarily be functional, interior detailing is not of importance, so the exposed fastener detailing is not going to be an issue for this build. The same exact procedure was also done with the solenoid firing box as well. After the pieces were bolted to the wall, the sculpted well beads were added to the locations, which flares in and camouflages the fastener that's soldered to the plate, as well as giving it the much needed detail of the weld. As for the boxes themselves, they are still fully functional. And as you can see, the way they're mounted to the plate is with that of two brass fasteners, which is very similar, which was done to the real Sherman. The insulation method is very strong and will hold up to the wear of RC use.
As for the firing solenoids, these are the Armor Packs kit supplied units. The fitting here is also the Armor Packs unit. The wiring was simply added and mounted in locations where I've seen it on some surviving Shermans. The other wire is just a piece of electrical wire, and this here was simply run up along the firewall and enter into the tank via the grill work. It's not exactly the most machined or perfected system, however, the system was used on the real British tanks. Now, as you can see, this is more or less of an afterthought. The British tanks, namely the Comet, utilized a more factory-made fitting system with these two units over here. These here are supplied with the armor pack set, however, will not be utilized on this build. And here are all the details now mounted into the model. The grill has also been fitted along with the exhaust manifold. The doors have been primed, painted, and mounted. As you can see, the two mounting fasteners are fitted to the hatch, and the other two holes are still present, even though no fasteners are there. The holes are there purely for detail purposes only. The rear grill work does feature its exhaust weathering soot ha that has been added. The component itself is fully bolted to the model. No adhesives are used. For the fasteners, there's three fasteners found on the exterior portion, which are found on the real vehicle. And on the interior portion, we have two bulkheads, which emerge from the firewall, in which the fasteners then bolt onto. As you can see, the pieces do have their sculpted well be detailing added, which adds in both structure and detail. It is a mirror image on both sides of the model. And here's the completed smoke system now fully mounted to the model and awaiting its electrical connections. As for the exhaust manifold themselves, you can see since the last scene they have been weathered with their rust and soot weathering. As well as the mesh work has also been fitted. As you see for the mesh work, I also used silicone for that of the assembly as it gives for a nice strong and temporary bond in case everything needs to be removed in order to perform emergency maintenance. In addition to the manifolds, the rest of the plumbing has also been fitted using the kit armor tech components, as well as, if you notice, for the seams, that was all covered up with that of the same silicone. For the same reason which was mentioned before on the smoke system, as well as for the manifold, in case I need to do emergency maintenance, I can easily take apart everything without causing any substantial damage. And here goes the back of the vehicle, now with the last of the detailing fitted. As you can see since the last scene, the other bit of detailing that has been added to the rear is that of the tow hitch and leaf spring setup. Unlike most of the other Sherman variants in which on most American Shermans, the tow hitch would be on an extender mount, which is located here on the corner of the hull. The Brits modified the Fireflies in having their tow hitch mounted in the middle portion of the hull. This is a location which is found on most British tanks and carries all the way up to today. The British modified their Shermans with the by first utilizing a British style tow hitch. The British style tow hitch differs from the American counterpart in many many ways and is this type of style tow hitch is also found on other contemporary British tanks such as the Cromwell as well as I also believe the Comet. As for what's unique about the British setup is unlike again on American tanks which it is a solid mount to the tank itself, the British went ahead and mounted the tow hitch on that of a leaf spring which looks just like one that you would find on a truck or a half track. The entire tow hitch setup that you see here is a new set that was added to eastcoastarmory.com. The set is comprised out of all resin. You have the leaf spring mounts. You have the leaf spring itself. The British tow hitch, which is designed to be made functional, as well as the mounting plate and the four mounting fasteners. The component is fully functional, however, it is not recommended to actually tow something with this as the resin does have limitations in that type of application. 
Now, one, if anyone's watching this and might be scratching their head as to how to get access to the engine compartment, this is actually a legitimate concern. As you can see with this location of the tow hitch here, the access to the door is going to be very limited. The designers knew this and designed the whole unit to swing out of the way. As you can see, there are two fasteners on either side of the mount. By simply pulling the pins out, this component here is removable, which then allows the crew access to get to the engine. Moving our way to the interior portion of the model, we can see here that a lot of work has been added to the stock electronics. Unlike the last video, the stock electronics have now been mounted and work is currently being done to clean up the wiring a little bit. However, the equipment mounts layout has all been set. Starting from the back of the vehicle and working my way to the front, takes us to first the smoke system, which was showcased earlier. Next to the smoke system, we have here the smoke system refueling system, which is a trademark on all of my 1.6 scale RC builds. The purpose of the pump is that it prevents and moves away the refueling of the smoke fluid from a good distance away from the vehicle. The purpose of that is because the smoke fluid can harm the finish, by having the smoke fluid close to the vehicle, it can cause spills or any type of other issues that can damage the, the paint. By moving the refueling away from the model reduces the chances of the smoke fluid making contact with the model. From the smoke fluid moves us to the speaker and the sound system. This is the stock Armortech speaker setup. The center portion here is the tank's rear control panel. It is going to be accessible underneath the engine hatch and basically the entire layout of this model is very similar to one of my M4A4, however with several modifications made. If we notice the control panel on this vehicle here is going to be a lot simpler compared to that on the M4A4. We have three switches as opposed to the multi-switch system on the other model. This large switch that you see here is that of the kill switch for the smoke system. This allows you to drive the tank with the smoke system off, which extends the life of the filament in that it's not being used all the time, as sometimes you might not want to utilize the smoke system when just driving around. This switch that you see here is a switch for the refueler, and this hole over here is going to be the kill switch for the tank's lighting when that emerges. As you can see, the control panel is not bolted in yet, as it is awaiting that modification in that system to be added. Once that system is added, this will be firmly bolted in place and will be completed. Moving to the recharge jack. This is one portion of the build that differs that from my older units. In my older builds, if you see on my video listings, I used to have two prong recharge setup with that of a switch. That system is a little bit more complicated as well as is a little bit more more machining and more engineering which is required to for that setup. Rather than using that setup, I went ahead and simplified the electronics by simply just having one plug. When it comes time to recharge the vehicle, you simply just pull out this plug, plug it into the recharger, and you're done. There's no switch to worry about, there's no on and off. Just plug it in, set it, and forget it. That's it. When it comes time to run the tank, you simply unplug the cord, stick the charge jack back inside of the model, close the hatch, and you're ready to run. Below the control panel, we have here the fan control box. This unit here is an aftermarket set from the following email address listed below. This setup here I have used on other Armortech builds in the past and is a very highly recommended unit. What this unit is, it is a drop-in installation modification that uses the Armortech smoke system and connects it to that of the Armortech sound system. The stock unit actually plugs into the motor and not the sound system. What this unit does is that it has throttle control and syncs up with the sound system. So if you give a little bit of throttle on the engine noise, a little bit of smoke comes out of the exhaust, but if you throttle up on the engine, more smoke is emitted from the exhaust system. Again, it's a simple addition and one that is highly recommended. 
Moving towards the center, we have here our batteries. The batteries were discussed in the previous video. One quick mod that I made, which is actually a temporary piece. If we notice, I have a piece of bubble wrap straddling across the battery leads. This is to prevent any type of accidental short circuits, which can happen when working on a model like this with exposed battery leads. It is a good way to protect the leads, which will prevent any type of expensive burnouts, which can possibly happen when during the course of these builds. More than likely, as the build progresses, I'll invest in some better caps that are made out of rubber, which thoroughly cover the battery leads, thus preventing any type of short circuits. Moving towards the side takes us to the controls for the turret, as well as the gun elevation. This is stock armor tech, and the unit itself is bolted to an angle, which is bolted to the Sponson support mounts, which are found on the side of the hull. By mounting it vertically, it keeps it out of the way and slims down the interior space. Here's the receiver, which is just simply siliconed in place, and this may or may not be moved as the build progresses. Moving towards the center, this was discussed previously, but to go over it again, this is the amplifier module, and below it is that of the main drive speed controllers. They are mounted in a tandem format. This saves space and also creates airflow amongst the two units, which aids in cooling. Located on the assistant driver's position is that of the actual power supply. The unit, if we notice, is canted to the side. The reason for this is to first allow access to the amplifier or speed control module in case any maintenance needs to occur in the future. With the piece canted out of the way, you can get access to the fasteners in order to remove this component. Also, once the model is built, the, this location here lies directly underneath the turret. The turret, so if the turret is removed, you can get access to all of said components. Another reason why the component is canted is that so it can that the power switch is more easily accessible from the hatch. Now this is a lot different from that of my M44 in which this lo this component here was located under the driver's hatch. For this build here, the way the wiring turned out, it was just more economical and simpler to mount the power supply in this position here. The irony is that on the since this tank is being built as British, the power supply is found under the British side of where you would drive a car, but obviously a Sherman is not the case. Also interesting factoid is that on the real Firefly, this hatch here would not be functional as this interior here on the rear tank was all removed in order to allow access for the longer 17 pounder shells. But I'll go in more in detail on that as the build progresses. One modification that I made with the wiring is that I replaced the stock wires which were found on the speakers with new wire from another source. The reason for this is not because the quality of the stock wiring was bad, in fact it's pretty good, but due, due to the spread of where the equipment's all laid out, the stock wiring was not going to be long enough in order to wrap around the batteries to get to the amplifier module. So new wiring that was longer was added in place. The old wiring was actually recycled and was utilized for that of connecting of the smoke system. Just like with the amplifier, the smoke system being in the rear and the power supply being mounted all the way in the front, the stock wiring was not going to be nearly as long enough to connect the two components together. For the wire that you see here, this was actually the stock wiring from the sound system and was simply patched into the power supply for that of the smoke system. As you can see, the wire is going to run along the sponson, which will be a lot more tidied up by the next video update and it goes into a distributor box. The reason for this is that this power cord not only does it power the smoke system but will also power the fuel the refueling pump once the vehicle is on. I'll demonstrate everything in action. To test the model I'll first turn on the radio which is pretty much standard on how you turn on any radio control tank and I will turn on the vehicle. The pops mean that the speakers are patched in with the Benedetti sound system. And I will now turn on the tank. 
Before I do though, currently as we notice, the smoke system is in the off state. Let me turn it on in order to get the filament heated up. Now, like I mentioned before, the filament is currently on and is heating up inside of the boiling chamber on the smoke system. I'll now turn the knob and fire up the sound system. that I like about the aftermarket fan control is the fact that it has LEDs. What's great about the LEDs is that you know when the system is functional and when it's working. There's two LEDs. The first LED is to notify that the power is on and the second LED is how you know when the sound system activated the throttle. Here we have the smoke system currently in its idle mode. And when I give it throttle, you're going to see a lot more smoke being exhibited from the exhaust, like such. In addition to the other RC functions, I am also in the process of calibrating and hooking up the tanks turd rotation. That's facilitated with this motor here. It's stock Armortech and simply plugs into the auxiliary power box, which was discussed earlier, and it's mounted on the side. If I move the stick on the radio, the motor rotates left and right, which is one is which is what one would expect for a turret turner. Moving our way to the side applicate armor, the armor tech kit does supply you with the armor plates. These armor plates were not needed on the M4 a Ford that I last did, but for this build will be utilized. They are comprised out of plates of aluminum and have their countersunk fastener locations pre-found on the plate. They simply mount into the locations which are pre-drilled into the kit and are very smooth install. In addition to keeping the armor on. The fasteners were also utilized to hold up the the plate and the mounting point for that of the power supply. In addition to the fasteners, if we notice I have two columns which have been siliconed on the inside portion of the plate and act as columns. The purpose of these columns is to prevent any type of bounce from this location here while the model is in operation. The bounce can cause fractures in the bodywork which will down the road really start hurting the look of the build. With the columns mounted, the piece is solid and is not going to go anywhere. With the interior component layout now all completed, as well as with the rear detailing out of the way, the next area of focus will be that of the front plate, as well as the top deck detailing. More information on that will follow in the next video update. And with that, that concludes this project update video for this 1-6 scale ArmorTech Rio controlled British Five Firefly. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook, and don't forget to check out eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thank you.